ओम ज्ञानतिमरंधस्य ज्ञानांजनिशलाकाय चक्षुरोन्मल तस्म श्रीगुरव नम नमा ओं विष्णुपदाय कृष्णपृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी इति नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्यदेशिणे वाचाकलतरूभ्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्रीअद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा टुडे वी आर डिस्कसिंग ऑन द टॉपिक ऑफ द युद्ध कांड ऑफ द रामायण एंड देर इन आई डिस्कस वन पर्टिकुलर पास टाइम एंड लुक एट इट्स यूनिवर्सल इम्प्लीकेशंस सो in the yuddha kanda there are many significant battles that happen mm-hmm. the battle the confrontations between ram and ravan Ra, lord ram and kumbhakarna and hanuman's rescue attempt after indrajit uh, knocks out uh, or he has there are different past times the confrontation with indrajit is actually the most prolonged there are multiple conflicts with him and basically indrajit knocks out <coughs> the royal princes from ayodhya on multiple occasions in fact if you consider in the ramayana there are three distinct days on which ram uh, confronts ravan it's it's interesting in the ramayana that ravan has the home advantage but he never uses the home advantage fully what he means is there are different commentators who have commented on this see there's one major difference between the kurukshetra war and the mahabharat war is that the kurukshetra war happens at one place which is at kurukshetra and both the armies are there and both the full armies fight on all days with each other hmm? now generally whenever one force invades another force say say for example right now there's a war going on between uh, russia has invaded ukraine so what happens is the forces of russia have to go to the forces of ukraine and one aspect of having the home advantage is that all the forces of the defending country are available whereas only that part of the attacking army which has actually come to that place is available so if russia attacks ukraine it is not that entire army of russia is going to be on ukraine at ukraine whereas the entire army of ukraine can be theoretically available may not be actually they may not deploy it because they may want to have other parts so what happens is so in that sense ravan has the home advantage his entire army is available whereas ram has in one sense ram has none of the ayodhya army but he has whatever forces he have he has with him but ravan's arrogance is the cause of his undoing and he can't believe that this army as he often calls it this army of mere mortals and monkeys mere humans and monkeys can even be a challenge for him that is why he remains secure inside his fortress so basically the geography of lanka as is described in the mahabharat in the ramayana is quite different from the geography of lanka as we see it today mm-hmm. so the point is that lanka is described as a huge island and within that island at the center is a huge fortress so when lord ram's army by using the bridge they come they are on the island but they are not inside the fortress so ravan stays inside the fortress and his <coughs> the fortress itself is quite impenetrable breaking the walls or breaking the doors is not easy at all 
So Ravan could have used two strategies. One is just stay inside and wait for Ram's forces to break through and come inside. Or he could have opened the fortress doors and brought his full army out. But he does neither. He has one one of his generals, whether it is his commander or any other, whether Indrajit comes once, Kumbhakarana comes once, <clears throat> or Atikaya, Mahakaya, all these warriors, they come and they come with an army. But all his generals do not launch a simultaneous attack. And they are all available. So it's so Ravan, Kumbhakarna, Indrajit, Atikaya, Mahakaya, all of them are never together at one time on the battlefield. So it, it seems to be like an obvious error. He has the home advantage. He could have used all the forces that he had and brought them. But he never does that. Now what is the reason for that? So different commentators have uh, addressed this issue but basically they boil down to Ravan's arrogance. He believes that just one of his generals is enough to destroy. And then the, as one by one his generals start getting destroyed, defeated and destroyed, he starts becoming desperate that like if he sends all his generals out in one go, he himself goes out together with all his generals, and if they are all killed, then he will fall in one fell blow. That's why, so initially it's out of arrogance and afterwards it's out of apprehension. So he, in one sense, never uses his full forces. Of course, we can say Lord Ram also never uses his full forces because he doesn't have the full forces with him. But whatever he has, they're all available with him. So, among all the battles that happen between Lord Ram's forces, and the and Ravana's forces who are coming out of the battlefield, the most, you could say, most damaging confrontation is between Indrajit and, and, and Lord Ram's forces. So, Ravan actually is not as much a threat. In one sense, he does not inflict as much damage on the Lord Ram's forces as does Indrajit. And in fact, this is the question which comes up in the Uttarakhand. And there, <coughs> the question is addressed that where the sages are praising, they describe the narration of the battle and they say that in many ways, Lakshman's killing of Indrajit is actually in one sense, not in, my, in all the senses, but in one sense, far more glorious than even Ram's killing of Ravad. So Indrajit was a very powerful warrior and there are multiple occasions when Indrajit actually seems to defeat and even devastate the army of the, uh, the forces of Ram. So we, the, the most celebrated, the most well-known occasion is when he knocks them unconscious and then Hanuman has to go and get the Sanjeevani, the herb, herbs from Himalayas. But before that, there is another incident. And that is the incident that we will focus on today. So this is the snake attack, as it is called. So this is among the first attacks by, by, Han, by Indrajit. So mainly, if we could say that, in, that there are four main battles with Indrajit. The final is with, uh, at Nikumbhavil where uh, Lakshman kills him. And this is the first. In between, there are two occasions where first he defeats them, he defeats uh, uh, Ram and Lakshman and they are revived by Hanuman. And second time, when there is a fierce fight and when he realizes he is being defeated, he slips away. So, and then Lord Ram goes and uh, Lakshman goes and finds him over there. So this will be, we will be discussing these three main topics. How snakes are dangerous, literally and metaphorically. And then how Indrajit weaponized sex, snakes. Weaponized means to use as weapons. And then finally, countering the snakes in our attack of snakes in our life. So, why are snakes so dangerous? <clears throat> so, multiple reasons. If we consider that among the many predators that are there, if we consider humans living in a more natural uh, or a forest setting, 
and there are many predators. But if they're lions and tigers and boars, those kind of predators are very easily visible, relatively speaking. Snakes, they slither around the ground, along the ground. So they are not easy to see. Hmm? Another thing is that, if you see any other predator, for it to kill, it actually has to rip the human body apart. A snake doesn't have to do that. Just one bite could be fatal. So in that sense, snakes are considered to be among the most dangerous of predators. Another point to identify is that, that you know, we understand all tigers or lions are threats to human beings. Now, <clears throat> but among snakes, there are some which are poisonous and some which are not poisonous. And unless one is trained, one will not be able to identify very easily which snakes are poisonous and which are not. And it's not as if, if some predators can be easily eliminated. For example, normally in places where there's human habitation, we will ensure that there are no, no lions and tigers or things like that living over there. But snakes can coexist. They cannot be very easily eliminated. So, because of these four factors, snakes are among, considered among the most dangerous of predators. <clears throat> if you see from other perspective, that is one of the, if we see there are many predate, many, if the material world in philosophically is considered to be uh, a place of danger and the danger is described using many natural metaphors. The most common metaphor is of, of the ocean, the material world is like a stormy ocean and another is of a forest fire. But if we consider among the metaphors that are metaphors of uh, animals that are used to personify, to represent, to symbolize the danger of material existence, the most common metaphor is of snakes. Hmm? That sometimes, for example, in the forest of material existence, there are various animals which are compared to various things. But that is a forest centric metaphor. That's in the fifth chapter of the fifth canto of the Shrimad Bhagavatam. But independent of such a forest centric metaphor, if we consider which predator, predator, which predatory animal, which animal which is a threat to human beings is most commonly depicted in the Bhagavatam uh, or in general in our philosophy, then that is the snake. The snake, in fact, uh, from what I have seen, there are at least 31 references in the Bhagavatam itself. Uh, to where the Kala Sarpa is talked about. So time as a snake. So now again time is all powerful, all devouring. So that indicates how dangerous the snake is. Another metaphor is that Kama is also considered to be a Sarpa. Kama is uh, here not just material desire but especially toxic material desire. The way Krishna uses the word Kama in the third chapter not in the sense of dharma, artha, kama, moksha. So, so that is also considered to be like a snake. And there are many metaphors. Mukund Malastutra has one and even uh, so the Shankaracharya's Chaura, uh, which is that? Lakshmi Narasimha Karavalamba Stutra also has uh, this metaphor of snake as of worldly desire, sensual desire as snake. And then it's not just within the Vedic tradition. If you consider outside the Vedic tradition also, in the Christian tradition, uh, Satan is said to come in the form of a snake. The snake comes and tempts Eve. And then Eve uh, tempts Adam. And then there is said to be the fall. So the idea of a snake representing darkness, evil, danger, that is widespread. And we see that, that is one of the reasons why in the Bhagavatam also, Modit Rishchik Sarpa Pisa Hatya, the Bhagavatam says that, that essentially people are, satis, uh, they are not, dis, they, they, are, uh, they are against violence, but snakes are often, snakes and scorpions are considered to be so toxic that sometimes their killing is not considered bad. That comes in the context of Narasimha Dev killing uh, uh, Hiranyakashipu who is compared again to a snake-like being over there. There is no explicit comparison but implicit comparison. So we will focus on the second metaphor over here, that of 
toxic desires, of desires that destroy our spirituality. So this is the verse, seventh verse from the Lakshmi Nasimha Karavalamba Sutra. That samsara sarpa vishadigda maho gratiyura damshtragra koti paridashta vinashta murte nagari vahane sudhabdi nirvasa shaure lakshmi narsimha mamadehi karavalambam. So we will develop this metaphor and see in one sense how this metaphor is played out in the battle between, uh, some, between Indrajit and Lord Ram's forces and especially during the snake attack of Indrajit. So what is this compared to? Samsara Sarpa Vishadigdha Mahogratiivra. So this is not the samsara, material existence itself is compared to be a snake. But this is a snake with Damshtragra Koti. There are millions of fangs it has, not just one but millions of fangs. And because and when these when a snake bites, what happens is we lose consciousness and we die. So here we lose consciousness, we lose our Krishna consciousness, we lose our spiritual consciousness. So Paridashta Vinashta Murte. Our awareness of who we are is Vinashta, it is destroyed. And then what is the way to be saved from this? So how so what happens is when when this Lakshmi Simakaravalamba Stotra is composed, so by Shankaracharya, he, he gives the problem and he gives some hint of the solution within that same problem. So he says that two things are required. Nagari Vahane Sudabdi Nivasa Shaure. So he says so that from the one who lives on the ocean of nectar, so he says that is Lord Vishnu, he comes on Garuda. And he comes on Garuda, and when Garuda comes, what happens is Garuda is considered as an eagle, a natural uh, threat to the snake. So the snakes fly away, flee from there. And then after that, he also, because he resides in the ocean of nectar, he can give nectar which can act as an antidote. And in that way, he can be saved from this distress. So, Lakshmi Narsimha Mamadehi Karavalambam. Please give me the shelter of your lotus hands. Please bless me with your hands. That's what he's saying over here. So this is the background of the snake being used as a metaphor. And with this background, let's now look at the battle itself. So how did Indrajit weaponize snakes? See, in general, what happens is whenever there is war, we humans are not naturally endowed with great physical prowess. So we resort to something other than our natural ability to increase our strength in fighting. And that access to something beyond our natural human endowments, that can happen in various ways. That can be simply the tools that we manufacture with our hands, uh, somebody might use a stone, somebody might use a knife, somebody might use an axe. Weapons which can be normally easily manufactured. Now beyond that, means th what, what does that mean? That things which are easily visible and accessible for us, we, we use them or reshape them as weapons. But beyond that, we could use more sophisticated means for accessing power. So that can be done through what we could call as uh, the traditional ways where the very <coughs> where humans or beings within the world access powers beyond their own. So that could be by praying to the Devata. So just like Ravan performed austerities to get blessings of immortality and other such blessings from the from Brahma and Shiva. Or in, in modern times it could be through technology. So the technology what we are doing is, like say there are weapons of mass destruction, whether it be nuclear weapons or biological weapons, what are we doing is, we are un accessing subtler forces within nature to weaponize those forces. So chemicals exist in nature, germs exist within nature, but we humans can weaponize them. So germs are a threat, but when germs are weaponized, then we have biochemical weapons of, biological weapons of mass destruction. So there is nuclear power existing within the atom, but when we access and weaponize it, then we have nuclear weapons. So snakes exist within nature. But Indrajit weaponizes snakes. So he uses, now the Sarpa Astra is not unprecedented. 
there are other occasions also when the sarpastra is used mm -hmm. but th those usages are significantly different from how indrajit uses the sarpastra so what happens is with respect to indrajit specifically how is it different that <coughs> the, now the, in the mahabharat the sarpastra comes uh, on multiple occasions one is in the battle between indra between arjuna and karna another is between the battle between between iravan who is one of the sons of arjuna who is killed and the demon commander who is on the side of the kauravas alambush and a third occasion is when it comes between ghatotkach and karna again so the snakes appear on the kurukshet on the kurukshet battlefield on multiple occasions and they are a threat but they are immediately countered what makes indrajit's use of the sarpastra unprecedented is two main factors so what happens is with with him and he attacks it is not just he targeting one enemy but his sarpastra because he has been blessed by the devtas his sarpastra expands and attacks the entire army and it that i mean he discharges one weapon that one x weapon expands into many many weapons and that they all just fall down unconscious it seems that they have become lifeless they are dead and what makes so, so one is the expansion of that one weapon to multiple weapons not is multiple but almost countless weapons and the second is that indrajit also makes himself invisible so his invisibility makes it even more difficult to detect him so the mystical elements play a far greater role in the ramayana than in the mahabharat so in so in so there are occasions a few occasions where the warriors become airborne and they are fighting from the air in the kurukshetra war the main occasion is when ghatotkach is fighting with karna he he uses mystical powers to attack from the airways once abhimanyu when he is circled by everyone else by all those warriors he tries to use his mystic powers to go into the air and try to gain that aerial advantage while defending himself after he has lost all his weapons but eventually both of them are felled but what happens is indrajit has his he has the aerial advantage he is in the air he is has a chariot which which is floating through the airways and on top of it he makes himself invisible so what happens is his aerial advantage it 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 is actually strategically a very significant advantage in fighting because somebody is at a higher vantage point what happens is their weapons multiple you they have greater visibility and then we have gravity which assists in the force with which the weapons can be discharged there is greater mobility so he has that advantage on top of that he has a sarpastra and on top of that he makes himself invisible so the triple advantage makes him his attack lethal and every all uh, and lord ram and lakshman they described that they are covered with so many arrows this fall completely keep fighting keep fighting keep fighting this is the first attack of indrajit and indrajit is still he he is still filled with his arrogance that i'll be able to defeat them so he he says that he thinks that all these remaining vanaras they are not worth my fight so he thinks that if i can just kill ram and lakshman then the all the vanaras will just get defeated they will get discouraged and they will quit so therefore he concentrates his attack on ram and lakshman alone and he covers them with so many arrows that they fall so at this point the when ram and lakshman fall in seen fighting uh, might is important weapons are important but morale is probably the most important thing as long uh, they, they said that that enemy is no long, not defeated as long as they don't accept defeat so it is far more important to defeat the spirit of the enemy than just the weapons of the enemy so what happens is when ram and lakshman fall it is devastating for the entire army and at that time sugriva he he so kumbha so indrajit he is invisible and he is laughing 
and while laughing itself invisibly he after ram and lakshman fall he calls out he says you know i will spare those who flee from the battlefield today if any of you are found here on the battlefield tomorrow you will be destroyed and laughing like that he returns so sugriva makes a desperate attempt if finally what happens is just before he is disappearing indrajit just to taunt or flaunt his victory he makes himself visible so sugriva makes a mighty leap into the air and tries to catch indrajit but indrajit is too fast and indrajit dis- disappears then sugriva has this a triple challenge in front of him first is that he has to do something are ram and lakshman actually dead are they alive what is to be done about it second is he has to rally his forces who are shaken and even shattered by the fall of ram and lakshman and third is he has to decide whether to continue the attack or what to do after that so he immediately thinks and he says and then he tells his priests you know can you do something about it and he says that you know whatever we are trying nothing is working so he te- not his priest i mean his uh, <coughs> he tells his th- those in his army who have some medical skill skills so then he says he says he makes one he says he tells hanuman and a few other warriors he says both of you take ram and lakshman right now immediately back to kishkin and there we will offer him proper care and he says the remaining we will stay here we will launch an attack on Ra- on ravana's lanka and we will destroy lanka so now sugriva is their king and everybody has to follow him but the his soldiers are torn apart if with ram and lakshman present they were not able to defeat then with their army already split will they be able to defeat should they attack or should they not attack so sugriva's spirit sugriva's courage is seen in his strategic decision but you know courage is not a substitute for competence So there is some indecision should they do this or should they not do this and at that time suddenly it appears as if a gigantic storm is coming on the horizon and it it sounds as if the waves that are coming are itself so stormy that the waves will the stormy wind not waves winds are coming they themselves will sweep all of them away they're, they're wondering what is this and some huge creature seems to be coming right from the sky down and the vanaras panic and they say is this indrajit already returned to finish all of us and what happens is as this huge being starts coming down from the sky and then as he comes down some of the vanaras especially hanuman hanuman is quite wise and well versed recognizes this is actually garuda so garuda comes over there so here what happens is that this when force this this principle is demonstrated when the forces beyond the human attack us forces beyond the human can also be used for counter attacking so counter attack forces beyond the human means snakes are weaponized by indrajit so indrajit is we could say on the demoniac side the anti god side so lord ram is on the godly side daiva swabhav daiva sampada so is garuda comes on his own over here and initially so when some unknown being comes we don't know is that person indifferent or is that person malevolent or is that person benevolent basically there are three possibility that person just doesn't care what is going on over there that person wants to make things worse or that person wants to make things better so there is that apprehension but garuda comes over there and he comes and he offers his obeisances to the prostrate bodies of ram and lakshman and then he just extends his touch and what happens is just as as soon as garuda appears just seeing his appearance the snake weapons they these are basically uh, the they are snakes which have stung ram and lakshman they themselves withdraw from the body and they start fleeing away and they start running for their life and seeing this the vanara forces feel oh this must be this must be something good for us 
this person this this force that has come is actually benevolent and then after that garuda touches the forms of ram and lakshman and through that touch they are they are revived and they are recovered they become healed and whole immediately and after this happens there is a intriguing twist over there that lord ram he comes back to consciousness and he looks at this being and he folds his hands and he says pray tell me who are you who has blessed us in such a wonderful way so this again is curious and this as a garuda excessive oh my lord surely you know me i am your eternal servant you know you are vishnu and i am your carrier garuda and then after that uh, he says i am happy that i was able to perform this service for you and i would like to continue this service so please give me your blessings please give me your permission so that i can pursue the snakes before they disappear into the nether worlds and lord ram gives his consent and then he disappears so what happened is over here lord ram does not is is seeming non recognition of garuda what is going on over here how, how does that to be explained see in the ramayana there is we could say a constant tension between lord ram's divinity and his humanity why is this tension there because the purpose of the ramayana is the driving purpose the driving question is what are the characteristics of the ideal human being what is the who is the ideal human being what are the characteristics of the ideal human being so to men to serve that purpose the ramayana in one sense maintains a slight distance from lord ram's divinity so specifically there are no prayers to ram at least not profuse prayers to ram the way there are in the bhagavatam that is there in later retelling of the ramayana especially that is the adhyatma ramayana has extensive prayers to lord ram the way the bhagavatam has but valmiki ramayana doesn't have that so the valmiki ramayana's purpose is to delineate the characteristics of the ideal human being so what happens is if this ideal human being is told is god then god can do anything and for god what is difficult doing any duty can be easy for god because he is omnipotent doing being dutiful for us humans is difficult because we have so many limitations but god has no limits limitations so <coughs> therefore there are multiple occasions when lord ram does not exhibit his divinity of course there are many occasions on lord ram when ex exhibits his divinity also hmm. so at the end of the ramayan also there is at the end of the ramayan war when the various devatas appear in the sky hmm. the devatas tell lord ram that you have fulfilled our purpose on the earth and you know it is by your blessings that i have been able to do it and then the devata say no not exactly he says actually you are our lord and you have descended to this world you are vishnu so has so, so this lead to some amount of uh, we could say puzzlement that is as some people say has lord ram forgotten his identity uh, his divinity uh, what has happened is the idea uh, the ramayan and ramayan iconographic has become quite a tool of uh, has become quite politicalized in modern india so because of that there are many theory theories to try to dis, uh, to downplay or even deny lord ram's divinity so some people say that actual ram was just a glorious warrior and later on he was made into god by his follow by his followers that's called as uh, in theology it's called as euhemerism that you know after a person's death that person is made into god but and one reason they justify it is by saying that if within the valmiki ramayana there is not much mention of ram's divinity but the point is it is not that there is no mention at all there is mention but every book has a particular purpose and that 
purpose is what is the focus of the book. Mm -hmm. So the focus of Ramayana is not proclaiming Ram's divinity. Mm -hmm. The focus of the Ramayana is identifying ideal human behavior and identifying the ideal human being. So within that narrative, whenever it is required, Lord Ram manifests his divine identity. But otherwise he does not. So in this case, that dynamic is coming apart, coming forward. That Lord Ram acts as if he does not know who, who Garuda is. Now of course we can give a much simpler explanation and say that it is Leela. It is Lord Ram's Leela that he doesn't act as God. But the Leela explanation can seem like an esca escapist explanation. That you are just, uh, for, for those who are skeptical, they say that you know, Leela can be used as justification for, it is what is, what is in philosophy, it is called as the explanation, non-explanation. That means it is an explanation. See, if one answer can explain, uh, if one answer can be the answer for all questions, then that answer is no longer an answer. It just makes questions irrelevant. So, you understand what I'm saying over here? That if we can have one answer which answers all questions, then is that actually an answer to a question or is that an answer that makes questions itself irrelevant? So, okay, so that's why in our tradition, in the, specifically in the Gaudiya tradition also, the concept of achintya is used actually very conservatively. Sometimes we use it very liberally that anything which we can't understand, we say it is achintya. But Jiva Goswami does not use it like that. And it has to be in that sense, he uses it specifically for a particular purpose that when there are two scriptural statements which seem contradictory, then the way to reconcile them is by achintatu. We accept the truth of both of them, but how exactly they are true, that is difficult to understand. And then he applies it in various domains with various examples. Uh, but the point is, that Leela explanation is itself not always the most satisfactory explanation from the intellectual perspective. So from the textual perspective, Lord Ram's divinity is not denied, but it is also not emphasized in the Valmiki Ramayana, so that the focus of the book is maintained. So because, ev because everything, has a, if somebody is giving a class on, say, is the, is, does the soul actually exist? Say, logical reasons for the existence of the soul. And in that, if somebody talks about repeatedly, you know, Krishna is God, Krishna has spoken the Bhagavad Gita and he says there is a soul. Therefore, there is a soul. Okay, that is an explanation. But what is happening is, that is like, to explain one unacceptable point, or difficult to accept point, we are bringing another not difficult to accept point. So to accept that the soul exists, if I start saying, okay, you have to accept that Krishna is the God, that the Bhagavad Gita is his word, and because he says it is God, so it is called like piling assumption on upon assumption. So in answering one question, we, we don't start with what the audience accepts, but we propose more things which the audience needs to accept so that they can accept this. So that is not considered a very persuasive strategy. So the Leela explanation can be used, but it is not the prominent explanation, especially when we are dealing with people who are skeptical. So, anyway, so this is, the, so the book Ramayana has a purpose. Valmiki Ramayana at least has a purpose. And from that purpose perspective, Lord Ram emphasizing his divinity is not the most important thing. That does not mean it is not there. It is definitely there. Many references are there to it. But Lord Ram does not go about brandishing his divinity constantly. Whenever he meets, he doesn't say, hey, I'm God, are you offering, offering obeisances to me or not? That never happens. <laughs> So that is not his mood at all. In the, so, in, so that's the uh, twist in this pastime. Now, let's look at, I started with the metaphor of how snakes are considered dangerous. So how do we counter the snakes in our life? And the third part we'll discuss, we'll conclude with this. So broadly speaking, when we have to deal with snakes, there are three ways. One is, you could say preventive. That is the, if somebody lives in a snake infested area, can we take some substances which will, which will immunize us, which will vaccinate us to snake bites. 
So even if they happen in the future, we'll be protected from it. The second is, if snake bites happen, then what do you do? We minimize the, we minimize the injury. At least say, you know, your tonic wit is used or something like that is used to bandage the area where the snake wound is, the snake bite is there. So if somebody's bitten on the legs, then stop the blood flow to other parts of the body. It does not reach the key organs like the heart or the brain and then the injury can be minimized. And the third is, we have some kind of antidote. So antidote is to counter the effects of the snake. So in one sense, before the snake attack has happened, while the snake attack has happened, to minimize it and then to counter it. So let's look at this from this, 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 these three principles. So sarpa it refers to, as I discussed, there are so many toxic desires in the world which can attack us. Which, in one sense, the world is filled with sense objects. And any sense object can inject us with sensual desires. But we also live in, today in a culture where the natural temptations of the world are weaponized against us. They are weaponized against us. So to give another metaphor, to illustrate this point, mm, that there is often the classic metaphor of the fish. You know, that the fish is caught by a bait. That there is, uh, that you have dangle a bait in front of a ship. Uh, sorry, not a ship, a fish. Then the fish moves towards the bait and gets caught by the bait. But those who are social scientists, especially those who are social media experts, they say that, I'll give an example to illustrate how dangerous social media can be is that suppose there is like a fisherman who knows all the fish inside a particular pond and who knows exactly which food item will attract which fisher, which fish and then exactly that kind of bait is dangled to catch that fish. So like that what has happened is especially people who are very active on the social media, uh, on the internet their data is all logged and the, exactly the kind of ads and promotional material is given to them which they will be attracted to. So it is like a customized bait for each particular fish. So when we are, <coughs> when, when we, so what has happened is, this is an example of natural temptations are there in the world but those temptations are weaponized to trap us. So how do we protect ourselves from, uh, from snake-like desires? So first is, like if you consider from a preventive perspective, first of all, identify. Identify what are the snakes that are lethal to us. We'll, we'll elaborate on each of these points and then we'll conclude. Second is, once I identify, okay, these are the snakes that are lethal to me, which are deadly for me, then we understand how we can, they attack us and where, when, how they attack us. And then, the, another preventive measure could be that just keep a distance from them as far as possible. Don't go into that area. Then, if they attack, then once the toxin comes, at least regulate it. Prevent it from spreading. And then finally is counter the toxin by appropriate antidotes. So, let's see what this means, each of these. So, if you look at the identifying the snakes that are lethal for us. So, see, while... As I said, snakes can be toxic. There are some snakes which are poisonous, some snakes which are not poisonous. But snake-like desires, worldly desires, it is often not so simple. So depending on the samskaras, the impressions that are there within our consciousness, some desire, we may be particularly vulnerable to some desires. And we may not be so vulnerable to other desires. So a bottle of alcohol may not be a big danger for a person who has never drunk alcohol or has no inclination for drinking alcohol. But for an alcoholic or even a recovering alcoholic, that can be a major danger. Mm -hmm. So for somebody who has no interest, not much interest in sports, you know, if there is some cricket match going on, that may not be much of a distraction. But for somebody who is very interested in a particular thing or who was very interested in a particular thing, be it politics or sports or whatever, then that could be a major distraction for them. So we have to first recognize what are the snakes that are lethal for us. So, so this, this whole thing about uh, though the things which are natural, they can be a danger. 
but the natural getting weaponized hmm, that is something which is unprecedented in human history in terms of addictive desires hmm. in the past that it happened in some small ways where say warriors so armies may have something like vishakanya where you know they would have women who had immunized themselves to poison by having regular dosages and then when the, when such a woman would go as a temptation to the opposing forces and the the soldier or the commander or the king of that force would unite with that woman that person would be killed but that was quite occasional but now uh, this is this has become extensive weaponizing the things which are normally uh, which are which are in one sense normal in the world one of the recent books which is like become a best seller in america is called as the empire of pain so what is this empire of pain it is in the in america especially in the west but in america uh, addiction to drugs is has been declared as a national emergency in many states and the scale of it is huge but this is very different this particular form of it's a drug drugs people have been dealing with drugs for a long time like just like people have been drinking alcohol for a long time but the modern epidemic of drug addiction has arisen not from people say going out of their way to buy some drugs because they wanted to get high it has started from basically pain killers so people who are maybe do some surgery the normal people living their normal lives they get in an accident or something like that their bone is broken and then uh surgery is done and during the sur before and after the surgery to deal with the pain the doctor prescribes them some pain medication now there are different kinds of pain medication and there are some pain medications which are designed to be addictive and so people take that medication and then they become dependent on that medication and so the statistics vary but many 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 researchers say that almost 50 to 80% of drug addiction in america has come not from people who take drugs because they just want to go high it has come from people who started off with painkillers and became hooked to painkillers so that is a painkiller is like a part it could be a part of a normal medication but that is weaponized so the idea of weaponization is something which is there so this is so there are many people now who who say had become addicted to painkillers and they somehow break free from that addiction but after that they have to go through a surgery or some other medical procedure then they have to factor in that i will have to do the surgery without taking any painkillers because once i take the painkiller i may become hooked on it again so that means painkillers could be a snake for some person for most people you take painkiller then there is pain and then when the pain goes away stop it but for all of us what is a snake that can vary from person to person so how do we identify a snake you know we compare the effect of ordinary snake poison there are basically two things so generally what happens is ordinary snakes when they bite us they'll just make us lifeless they'll make us inactive but when the snake of worldly desires bite us samsara sarpa vishadigdha mahogra tivra so spiritually we become lifeless but materially we may not always become lifeless materially somebody may actually become hyperactive or even frantic of course it depends on to what extent a person has been being bitten say so if a person is bitten to the level of tamoguna then a person may be inactive but what happens is even tamasic people are not constantly tamasic you know what happens is to sustain tamoguna also they have to come out of tamoguna <laughs> that means if a person is hooked on to drugs or hooked on to video games or hooked on to alcohol i say i don't want to do anything i just want this but to get that thing they have to come out of tamoguna to rajoguna or something like that to get procure those things also but broadly speaking uh, the material poisons they just make us inactive whereas this we could say what is the weaponization of worldly desires then that makes us spiritually lifeless but it makes us materially hyperactive 
So to identify what is a poison for us, we have to look at phalena parichayate. We need to know by the fruit. So for somebody, the toxic desire could be fame. Fame, recognition. That means what? That whenever any service will give me visibility, popularity, fame, I am very energetic for that service. And if some service, nobody is going to recognize it, nobody, what is the use of doing the service? So we start valuing the service, not based on how much it is connecting us with Krishna, but on how much it is giving us visibility and popularity in the world. So if our energy level is determined by that, then that particular service could also become like a toxin for us. So we need to identify what is a snake for me. Now that doesn't mean we stop doing the service immediately, but we recognize that this effect can be there and we take appropriate measures to counter that effect. And another pro pro so now we may say that, oh, if from this definition there are snakes everywhere in the world. The world is filled with temptations. So what do I do? It's like I live in a world where snakes are all around. Yes, okay. So then wh what can we do? We need to keep a distance from tempting objects. That is the, the objects which degrade our consciousness, which drag our consciousness down. Krishna says that the smatvam indriyanya adav niyamya bharatarshabha. Keep a distance from them. And then the best way to keep a distance from them is to actually, because we are talking about subtle things over here. In, the, in our consciousness, it's not possible for us to empty our consciousness. The best way to empty our consciousness of toxic desires is to fill them with healthy desires. Sroto ganasta maranam bhajava sudevam. The Bhagavatam says that the, the worldly desires keep coming like waves. So it's very difficult to empty our consciousness. Rikta matayo. That to make the consciousness empty is not possible, but again fill it with Krishna. And then more importantly, so the second, we need to find our Garuda. Now what do we mean by our Garuda? See, there are two things. When the snakes attack, the snakes have to be driven away. Now we can do, make our efforts to drive away the snakes. But if a Garuda-like influence comes in our life, then Garuda's power is far greater than our power. And that Garuda's power will drive away those desires, those snake-like desires from us. So it is not just a matter of our will. No, I will not do this, I will not do this. No, we need, our Garuda means something or someone that inspires us with uplifting desires, that inspires us with pure and powerful desires, and that will drive out the lower desires. And that is why satsanga is so important. So for us, our spiritual master, our senior Vaishnavas, those who inspire us, they are like the Garuda for us. So when the Garuda man comes, the snakes automatically go away. So we need to know what is the Garuda for us or who is the Garuda for us and keep that close to us. Uh, so it's, it's actually in one sense much easier to do this than to keep the snakes away or to drive the snakes away ourselves. That's why Prasanga Majaram Pasham, <clears throat> the Bhagavatam says that attachment is a jaram. Jara is old age. A jaram means that which never grows old. So, at, so our bodies grow old, but the desires never grow old. They don't become weak uh, so easily. Prasanga majaram pasham atmanava kvayogidu saeva sadhu shukruto moksha dwaram apavritam. But if we can become attracted to the saintly people, if we can become attached to saintly people, we become filled with the desire to serve them. Then those desires we can actually open the doors for liberation. They will drive away the toxic desires from our heart and our lives. Now, we are in one sense... This is not a hypothetical situation. We are already bitten by some snakes. So what do we do? We have to limit the spreading of the snakes. This is where discipline and regulation comes in. So we may have some weaknesses. We may have some vulnerabilities. But we regulate the indulgence. We don't let it become excessive. And that is why dharma, the principles of dharma come in. So there are various civilized, cultured, sanctified ways in which a person can have indulgence. Uh, but that has to be kept within limitation. That's like, okay, this part of the body is bitten, but I'll make sure that the, that the blood doesn't, from there doesn't go to the remaining body. That's why there, is indul there may be indulgence, but that can be regulated. 
and then um, ultimately there are a few more slides i don't think i can complete all of them actually there are six more slides but i'll uh, focus on one last point before we conclude it so essentially what happens is when garuda comes then the toxic desire the snakes flee and similarly for us to the extent we can bring the garuda of the spiritual master of the deities of shastra that which infuses us that which injects us with spiritual desires to that extent we are safe we may be knocked down so this point of focus on the in between what what does it mean that our future is determined not so much by our falls but by what we do in between the falls that means it is we live in a world where we will all be sooner or later infected by worldly desires we will fall but okay we fall what do we do after that we just say fallen or do we try to rise that a snake bites snake bites means we succumb to some desi some desires come inside us and we succumb to them but do we just quit after that or do we try to do something after that so yes the snakes will bite but do we just cave in or do we try to connect with our garuda do we try to invoke the presence of the garuda do we try to get the nectar the garuda is just one for garuda drives away the snakes but garuda on the back of garuda is vishnu and vishnu is nagari vahane sudabdi nivas shaure that he is in comes from the ocean of nectar he resides in the ocean of nectar so the ultimate antidote is not just invoking the presence of garuda who will drive out the snakes but on garuda is vishnu and it is vishnu who is the source of ultimate nectar so if we can connect with the lord if we can invoke the presence of the lord in our hearts if the lord becomes an enduring presence then that is the supreme protection that protection can protect us from not only past infections or present infections but even future infections and that is what shri prabhupada wanted when he started the international society for krishna consciousness that we become conscious of krishna we invoke krishna's presence in our consciousness not just invoke it but central make that the central reality of our consciousness and in that way we will be protected even while being in this world where the snake and the poison of toxic desires can come upon us in many different ways we may fall but if we rise from the fall okay i did something terrible but instead of simply beating myself up because i did something terrible we can see that okay i did something terrible that means i was bitten by the snake at that time and i was knocked off i was knocked down but okay it's not that these toxic desires are are tormenting us with the same intensity all the time that intensity rises at some times and that time we may be powerless but after that what happens do we try to reconnect restrengthen ourselves reconnect ourselves with krishna if we do that then eventually we will overcome these temptations and we will be able to ultimately become safe by become by spiritualizing by krishnaizing our consciousness so i'll quickly summarize i spoke on three main points today we talked about how snakes are so dangerous that among all predators in nature the snakes are most commonly used to signify the dangerousness of material existence that they are equated with death they are equated with worldly desires and they are also equated in the abrahamic tradition with the source of all worldly desires with the uh, satan is compared to a snake and then we talked about how indrajit weaponized snakes how he he had the aerial advantage he had a sarpastra which could multiply into manifesting thousands and millions of snakes and then he made himself invisible also so at that time when uh, garuda came garuda came to the rescue and saved and lord ram's not recognizing garuda it reflects the tension between lord ram's divinity and humanity that comes from the purpose of the ramayana valmiki ramayana the purpose is not to focus on lord ram's divinity but to focus on depicting the character of a ideal human being and the last part we discussed is how to deal with the snake like desires and their attack in our lives so first is identify what are the snakes for us then try to keep a safe distance from them and most importantly is 
try to bring close the garuda within us and the gift that the garuda brings so the that those things which up bring uplifting desires for us those people those places those stimuli and ultimately the supreme gift from all of these is the manifestation of krishna in our hearts thank you very much hare krishna shri shri ramachandra bhagwan ki shri prabhupad ki गौर भक्त बिंद की जय गौर प्रेमानंदी